How you doing? There are countless ways to measure the apogee altitude of a rocket, which is the highest altitude it reaches along its trajectory. I know for myself the most reliable method I've found is to simply use an electronic altimeter, like the Altimeter 3 from Jolly Logic for example. The way most of these devices work is based on barometric pressure. They take advantage of the fact that since the atmosphere is a fluid susceptible to gravity, the pressure decreases as you increase in altitude, and so pressure readings recorded by the onboard barometer can be converted directly to units of distance, or altitude. Other methods exist include calibrating one or multiple cameras, whether they be onboard the rocket or on the ground, to estimate the apogee altitude. You can see this example with Air Command rockets who experimented with many methods of apogee altitude estimation and were a partial inspiration for this video. With all of these different methods in mind, I wanted to test a method that had little cost and wouldn't add any mass to the rocket I'd be measuring the altitude of. For this, I'd be testing a technique that uses the principles of trigonometry to estimate the altitude of a rocket while still being on the ground. The goal for this video is to determine how accurate this method of altitude estimation really is. So, to briefly explain the process of how to estimate the altitude of a rocket using trigonometry, we need to break down the situation so that we can create a simple model that uses right triangles which we can study the properties of. In this first diagram, the launch of the rocket is modelled with one right triangle. In this example, to estimate the apogee altitude of the rocket, one must measure the distance between themselves and the launch site, a distance we will call L. In measuring the angle between our location and the apparent apogee of the rocket, an angle we will call alpha, we can estimate the altitude of the rocket at that time, a variable we will call h. Using some very simple trigonometry, we know that h will be equal to the distance l multiplied by tangent of alpha. However, an issue with this method is that due to its simple nature, it fails to take into consideration the parabolic trajectory a rocket follows, and so has a tendency to be quite inaccurate. In this first situation, if the rocket follows a parabola away from the individual taking angle measurements, it will underestimate the apogee altitude of the rocket, and so the value of h will be too small. The opposite phenomenon occurs as the rocket's trajectory brings it closer to the individual, this time overestimating its apogee altitude. To solve this issue, I would employ two individuals at two known distances from the launch pad in three-dimensional space, 90 degrees apart. Doing it in this manner takes into account the parabolic nature of the trajectory of the rocket, and it's just a matter of averaging the results obtained by both individuals to get as close to an approximation as possible to the apogee altitude. To measure the angles in question, I would use a device known as a theodolite. For this project, I obviously needed two of these devices, so I fashioned one out of the jaw stand used for my water rocket projects, along with a 3D printed mount for an iPhone which would measure the angles with this built-in gyroscope. Since this project was under somewhat of a time crunch, I had to use a music stand with an adjustable head to measure the secondary angle, Again, a phone could be propped against the stand to measure the angle. For the launches I do to test this method, I used a known distance for both individuals of 7.2 meters, which we would later find could have been longer, but was limited due to the maximum length of the ignition cable I'd used to launch the rocket, since I didn't deem it practical to run several meters as the rocket launches to record the measured angle. To analyze the accuracy of this method, I'll be comparing results gathered by the method using trigonometry to real results obtained thanks to the Altimeter 3, which will act as our control, since it's widely considered a relatively precise device and the most precise altitude measuring system at my availability. It is also interesting to note that a similar method of trigonometry was used by the National Association of Rocketry in the US and other rocketry groups for official competitions, so there's already some merit to this method. With all of that out of the way, it was time to put this method to the test. Five, four, three, two, one.
one went way too high for me to catch. Now, in terms of the results of this experiment, I've tabulated here every angle measured during the three launches we performed. I've organized it so each column represents the three launch attempts, and both alpha 1 and alpha 2 for the rows. As you can see, the angles varied only by a few degrees for the most part, but even a degree or two can have a large impact on the final calculated apogee. However, for alpha 1 on the third launch attempt, the rocket flew over the top of the theodolite, rendering a 90 degree or more measurement for that particular flight at that location, which cannot be calculated into a meaningful altitude reading, so we were stuck with the value of alpha 2 of 84 degrees. This issue was most likely caused by the aforementioned short distance of L1 and L2, that being the distance between each individual and the launch site. In terms of calculating the apogee altitude with this method, I just averaged the apogee altitude results obtained by both alpha 1 and 2 to obtain the final reading, whilst keeping consistent significant figures of course. The final results with the trigonometric method were 63.6, 54.9, and 68.5 meters approximately. Comparing this to the results measured with the altimeter, our control, it recorded 71.9, 67.4, and 68.0 meters for all three flights. Now, it's difficult to know just by looking at these numbers whether this method was truly a success, so I calculated using a very simple formula the degree of variation between the measured results and the quote-unquote real results obtained by the altimeter. For this, I averaged all three results from the trigonometric method and all three real results. With these numbers, I just calculated the absolute value of their difference divided by the average of all three results. And this gives us a degree of variation of less than 0.1, or 10%. Depending on where you look, different degrees of variation are considered acceptable for a coherent result. In this case, I'll use 0.2, or 20% as the maximum acceptable degree of variation, since that's the value I've seen in my own classes. In that case, using trigonometry to estimate the apogee altitude gives reasonably close results. So by all means, it's a success. Now, I'll deviate from the topic of trigonometry for a moment, since it's often true that when launching rockets, it's beneficial to have a rough estimate of how high the rocket will go before actually launching it, whether that be to know what sized field is appropriate for the rocket, or how high to set a drone, or just out of curiosity if you don't own a precise altitude measuring device. There are a few great simulators out there, both for solid motor rockets and water rockets, but I wanted to explore a way of estimating the altitude of the same rocket tested in this video manually to get a better understanding of it all and to have a more versatile method of estimation. Now this includes some maths and physics, so if this doesn't interest you, feel free to skip the next chapter in this video. To estimate the apogee altitude of any projectile, in this case a rocket, we must first create a simple diagram of its initial conditions. Here I've represented the initial velocity of the rocket, or the velocity of the rocket directly after burnout, as a vector. I'll call this velocity v0, and assign it a value of 49.4 meters per second, which is the value that Open Rocket gives, the simulator I use for all my rockets. Now, this does make this whole process inherently redundant, since I'm already using values from a simulator, but this is for demonstrative purposes, and the burnout velocity can be calculated using other methods, which are beyond the scope of this video. I'll represent here the launch angle alpha, not to be confused with the previous alpha angles I've talked about in this video. Now it's important to note that I cannot simulate a launch at 90 degrees, since later on we'll be dividing by the cosine of alpha, and if alpha were to be equal to 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 degrees is 0 and we'll be dividing by 0, which isn't possible. So I've chosen a launch angle of 89 degrees, which also allows the rocket to follow a parabola, which is a more realistic flight profile regardless. With this initial velocity plotted, we can decompose it into two respective axes, and call these new vectors vx0 and vy0. Using a bit more trigonometry, we know that vx0 is equal to the cosine of alpha multiplied by v0, and that vy0 is equal to the sine of alpha multiplied by v0. Using Newton's second law, we know that the sum of all forces on a system is equal to mass times the acceleration of that system. In our case, however, the sum of all forces on the system is simply the weight of the rocket, since after burnout, the rocket is in freefall. Weight can be expressed by the mass of the system multiplied by the gravitational constant g, or approximately 9.81 meters per second squared. Knowing that the sum of all forces on our system is just weight, we can conclude that the acceleration is equal to minus g along the vertical y-axis. Now we can express the acceleration of the rocket along both axes. Along the x-axis, it's zero, and along the y-axis, it's minus g. These expressions will come in handy with these next steps. Firstly, we know that the expression of the acceleration as a function of time of a system is a derivative of the expression of velocity, 
So in determining the primitive of both expressions on both axes, we find that the velocity as a function of time on the x-axis is the cosine of alpha multiplied by v0, and on the y-axis it's minus g times t, t being our time variable, plus the sine of alpha multiplied by v0. And the constants of integration were determined thanks to the initial vector diagram by plugging in the initial conditions. These expressions of velocity are themselves the derivative of the displacement functions, so in determining the primitive a second time, we find that the displacement as a function of time on the x-axis is the cosine of alpha multiplied by v0 multiplied by t. And on the y-axis, it's negative a half of g multiplied by t squared plus the sine of alpha times v0 multiplied by t. With these new displacement functions, we can conduct a change of variable. With the expression on the x-axis, we can reorder it so that we can express time as a function of x, and we find that it equals x divided by v0 times the cosine of alpha. With this expression of time, we can plug it back into the displacement function on the y-axis and obtain a function which is the displacement of the rocket on the y-axis as a function of the displacement on the x-axis, also known as a trajectory function. In simplifying the expression and by plugging in our known values, we find that the trajectory function is equal to negative 9.81 divided by 2 times 49.4 squared times a cosine squared of 89 degrees times x squared plus a tangent of alpha times x. By this point, we can recognize that the trajectory function is a polynomial of the second degree, meaning we can write it as a simplified formula of ax squared plus bx plus c where a is equal to negative 9.81 divided by 2 times 49.4 squared times the cosine squared of 89 degrees, and b the tangent of alpha times x. This means studying its properties is relatively simple. For instance, to determine the apogee altitude with this function, we can start off by using the fact that the apex of a polynomial exists on the x-axis at the x-coordinate of negative b over 2a. So in plugging in the expression of negative b over 2a back into our function, we find that our final apogee altitude reading is 124.34 meters. Now, here's where I ran into some issues. As you can see, the apogee altitude using this method is quite a lot larger than those measured with almost every flight with this particular rocket. In fact, its highest recorded apogee was merely 87.2 meters. So to try and mitigate this, I tried developing a method of estimating the apogee altitude with the same simple inputs, but this time taking into account atmospheric drag, since I figured that was the main element missing from this method. So I developed a small program in Python that would plot a trajectory with atmospheric drag included. I won't go into detail about the differences between quadratic and linear drag or different approximation methods, since I'm not even confident the code is 100% correct. However, even with this method, I still only got down to 117.86 meters. However, this issue doesn't just exist with my own predictions. OpenRocket itself estimates an apogee altitude of 105 meters for this same rocket, over 52% greater than the average for all three flights recorded by the Altimeter 3 for this video. I'm not entirely sure why this discrepancy exists for all simulations, especially since OpenRocket tends to be relatively reliable. Perhaps it has something to do with the local wind conditions greatly affecting the rocket's trajectory, or underperforming motors, or just a systematic error that exists in all simulations. Regardless of this, it's time to get back to the trigonometric method for some closing thoughts. So, when it comes to estimating the apogee altitude of a rocket using trigonometry, I've shown at least at a small scale in this video that it can be a decently reliable source of information and proves it possesses some potential. However, it's also not the most precise method, which could come down to the equipment I was using or user error. To mitigate this, higher quality equipment for measuring both the angles and distances from the launch site could help. In saying this, I believe this somewhat defeats the purpose of this method in the first place, since it's meant to act as a cheaper alternative to electronic altimeters. Furthermore, the benefit of adding no mass to the rocket being measured is somewhat undermined by the fact that most commercial altimeters weigh only a few grams, and wouldn't meaningfully affect the rocket's performance, especially considering the plethora of other variables. On top of this, using this trigonometric method takes a lot more setting up, and at least two people to do it effectively. But if you're willing to go through the setting up, then this method is a reasonable alternative to estimate the apogee altitude of a rocket. To finish off, I'd like to thank Isabel Leng who volunteered to measure angles for all the flights performed in this video, and also helped film and set up the launch site. I'd also like to mention Air Command Rockets once again who experimented with a similar method in the past and who partially inspired this video. And thank you for watching this slightly longer formed video. Be sure to leave any suggestions in the comments on future video ideas you'd like to see. Until next time, see ya!